Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Thank you so much for making History Shorts part of your daily routine. And if you have not already done so, make sure you click that subscribe button. If you have a comment, you can find me at www.historyshortspodcast.com. If you like this show and want to support it, the best thing you can do is tell a friend. You could also spread the word on social media, leave a review, or buy me a coffee at buymecoffee.com forward slash history shorts podcast. Have a great rest of your day and enjoy today's episode. Our guest today is a literary giant whose historical novels have brought history to life for millions. Jeff Shera is a master storyteller and New York Times bestselling author of such works as Gods and Generals, The Last Full Measure, and the most recent, The Shadow of War. Mr. Shera, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's my pleasure. So you come from a family that's deeply rooted in their passion for history and storytelling, with your dad being an award-winning author of historical fiction himself. But can you walk us back to the moment that sparked your own interest in history, and how did that transition into a career in writing? Well, it really didn't start as an interest in history so much. I mean, I didn't major in history in college or anything like that. In fact, my father didn't either. Uh, what it, it was more a, a, a passion for characters, a passion for the people and storytelling. You mentioned the word storytelling. My father was the master storyteller. And growing up, I mean, he taught at Florida State University, would teach creative writing. And I would sit in on the classes and listen to some of his lessons and they stayed with me. And uh, but the actual sort of uh, the kick that to actually get me started writing came from Ted Turner. Um, I mean, when we made the film Gettysburg in 1993, uh, Turner put up the money. It was his film, and it, it was an enormous success. I and mean, the film was based on my father's book on the Killer Angels. Uh, and but my father had been gone for five years, and so there there was no way to get him to do anything else. Ted wanted to make more movies. They came to me and they said, wouldn't it be great to take your father's book, and, which is only Gettysburg, and go before and after with other stories, some of the same characters, new characters, and so Ted can make the movie. Well, okay. I mean, because it was intended only to be a film that someone else will adapt for a screenplay, I had no fear. I mean, I mean you know, people ask me all the time, weren't you afraid to write a book? Uh, no, because we had no expectations. Uh, and it, the, we actually had the conversation that if whatever the story is that I come up with, if it's lousy, it goes in the trash. I mean, nobody will ever see it. So I, I started writing this manuscript um, in, for Gods and Generals. And meanwhile, my The Killer Angels, on the strength of the film, is a number one bestseller. And my my father's book, I mean, they're being published by Random House in New York. So I'm talking to the publisher up there, and I told her what I was doing. I said, I'm working on the prequel called Gods and Generals. And she said, oh, send us the manuscript. Okay. I mean, I again, no expectations. I mailed them the manuscript. The phone call I got back was, we don't care if it's a movie. We like the book. Here's a contract. That moment, that was September of 1995, that changed my whole life. Because from that moment forward, I was a writer. And when Gods and Generals came out, it debuted on the bestseller list. It's something my father never saw in his whole career. Well, I was under no illusions that the great American author had arrived. I mean, I knew people wanted more of the Killer Angels. They wanted more of my father's book. And so, you know, I got cut slack, you know, which was very nice. And went all around the country on a 59-city book signing tour. Um, and then, then, of course, it's time to write the sequel. Um, the, the last full measure, uh, now I'm scared to death because now there are expectations and now there's a publisher in New York who wants me to hurry up. You know? <laughs> so, but, you know, that's what started it. And, and that was, as I say, that was nearly 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, you haven't stopped. No, this is amazing. Like I said, no. it's a it's a staple Christmas gift at, at my house. Well, home. I have to say that there's a reason for that. My My father taught, as I said, at Florida State, he could never make a living from his writing. You know, he, he had to make a living teaching because his writing never paid him anything. And even when he won a dual surprise, I mean, for the Killer Angels, still, it wasn't a successful book commercially. Um, I am very, very fortunate, and I don't take it for granted, that I can do this full time. And that makes an enormous difference because I can turn out a book every year or a book every year and a half 
um, and do the research and do what it takes, which is a monstrous advantage that my father didn't have. Absolutely. And actually, perfect segue, because my next question deals with the research process, because you have written about so many different uh, historical periods. What is your process for sifting through all the vast amount of information available? How do you choose your topic? And then how do you strike that balance between historical accuracy and creative license? Most of the time, the topic is sort of an agreed upon thing with my publisher. I mean, we, we, and we talk, we debate, we talk about all kinds of different topics. Some are, some are better than others. And they'll toss some out because they just don't want to do that and they don't think it'll work. Uh, then there's something I don't want to write. Um, and then we come to a happy medium and then, you know, I start to work. The, um, the research really is the most important part of it. Um, all of my, I mean, my stories are based on real events. They're, you know, real history. Everything in the, in the book is accurate historically. The characters are real people. Well, when you do that, you better get it right you, because people care. I mean, somebody actually said to me a while back, how dare you put words in the mouth of Robert E. Lee? Okay, fair enough. I mean, challenge accepted. Um, but if I'm going to do that or put words in the mouth of Dwight Eisenhower or George Washington or whoever it might be, they better be the right words because people care. And if I don't, if I play around um, and the book is, is counterfeit, it deserves to be dismissed. And I mean, it would be dismissed. So I'm very careful about that. But that's then that's the greatest part of it is doing the research, hearing the voices of the people. And by that, I don't mean something mystical. I mean, you go back. Find the original source material, diaries, memoirs, collections of letters. It doesn't do me any good to rely on a modern biography because you're getting the biographer's take. Um, and I, you know, I have to go back and hear the original word. So I, I hunt down. Uh, and here's another advantage I have over my father. Uh, in my father's day, there was no Internet. And, you know, he had to track down every source literally, you know, one at a time. It might take him three or four months which is why it took him seven years to write The Killer Angels. I can't afford that kind of time. But with the Internet and some of these rare used out-of-print book sites, um, I can go in with a credit card and literally in a week I have a library, you know, which is a wonderful thing. So I've got the resources. I typically read 30 to 40 books for every book that I write. Um, wow. it, just, it just works out that way. Uh, and, only, and all the research comes first. Um, I, I can't go back and forth, you know, research a little, write a little. That just doesn't work for me. Um, but I do all the research first. I make a lot of notes. And then when I feel like it's ready, it's time to write the story, um, the, the story is ripe, you know, inside of my head. It's kind of the way it feels. Then I sit down and I start to write. And it's every day. My wife will tell you, I mean, I'm doing this seven days a week. Wow. Do you have like broad map where you're going with the story? Or do you look at the event itself, the historical event, like, all right, that's going to be the broad map of where you're going with it? Well, the history, because I'm working with real events, you know, and, and historical fiction can be anything. I mean, you, you can write a, you know, something about outer space. I mean, you can do anything you want. Uh, and that fits the, the description of, of um, historical fiction. What I'm doing though, because I'm getting, I'm doing the history accurately, um, it it just need, it needs to be done that way. And um, you know, I would say that um, working on these characters, the story sort of writes itself. In that the history is, I mean, the history is what it is. Most of the time, there's a distinct beginning. Um, and then it goes, and then I have to figure out what the ending is, or it's the other way around. There's a distinct ending, and I have to go back and sort of, where am I going to start this? You know, what's going to start this story? But I, I've never done an outline. I, people ask me that all the time, because apparently that's what they teach in some creative writing classes, is that you need to make an outline. Never have. Um, it's it's in my head. And I, once I start working, sometimes I'll start veering off in a direction I didn't expect to go in. Um, but that's okay. I mean, if, if that's what I have to do, I don't, I don't stick to a blueprint inflexible. I mean, I'm not inflexible about here's the story I want to tell and it's got to go like this. No, I'll, I'll vary all over the place. So the, I guess the next question is, 
Your stories are so character driven. You give life to these historical figures. It's almost like they're dry on paper somewhere else and you kind of breathe life into them, which is amazing. It's such an amazing skill. Is there any favorite character that kind of really stuck with you when you were working and even long after you were done writing the book and moved on to others, that that one character that just kind of you felt like you really had a connection with when you were writing your book? Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, it was Ben Franklin. Well, I, I did a two book set on the American Revolution. And again, I'm searching for characters because when you go back that far, there's not that much material uh, to, for, you know, for doing research. And I found Ben Franklin's autobiography. I found an account of somebody else who were there. I have Lafayette's biography. Um, I have Light Horse Harry Lee's um, memoir that he wrote in 1812, you know, when, when Robert E. Lee, his son, was barely born. Um but, you know, these are the, the things I need. But in going to, and doing Franklin, I had so, so much fun because he is the real American. I mean, he's the first real American, whether he's in England, which was where he is before the war starts. And then when he's in Paris trying to convince Louis, you know, Louis the, the 16th, come into the war on, on our side um, and then everything in between. And his relationship with his son, which is bad, um, his relationship with, you know, George Washington, which, you know, builds over time, um, the rivalry with John Adams. Uh, I mean, it's good stuff. And, and besides that, he's funny. You have to have a certain amount of fun. I mean, when I did, I did a book on World War I, and you think about World War I, it's the most grim four years in human history. I mean, it's just a horrible time. Well, I did the book. Well, if you write a book like that, that's grim, page in, page out, you never, you know, everything is grim. Nobody's going to want to read that. You know, after 20 pages, people are going to put it down. There's got to be humor. And I found humor in that story. And, and, and that, that was so great. And with Franklin, he gives you so much uh, of that. That, um, I mean, you know, the other, I mean, the other one I would mention is Dwight Eisenhower, um, because of Patton. You know, George Patton is sort of the counter, he's sort of the anti Eisenhower. And, um, and it was a great relationship. And I have Patton's diary. Well, what do you write a diary for? Who are you writing it to when you're writing it? You're writing it to yourself. And of course, nobody, you don't, you don't think somebody, you know, 60 years later is going to be reading this thing. Um, well, I did. And I read Patton's diary. Well, in there, he talks about what he really thinks of Eisenhower and Montgomery and Omar Bradley and all of this stuff. That was a, a great deal of fun, too. Yeah, you mentioned uh, To the Last Man, your World War One book. Um, I actually remember using excerpts from that book with my students to kind of try to bring it more to life for them. Um, they really enjoyed it years ago. I think you doubt it's been, has it been 20 years already? About that, yeah, that's right. All right. Can you tell us a little bit why you think historical fiction is uh, a very important genre uh, for contemporary readers that kind of complements nonfiction? At first, when I was doing this, I ran, I'm, I'm, I know a lot of academic historians because of the Civil War primarily, and I ran into resistance. I ran into people sort of dismissing what I did um, because I wasn't, you know, I don't have the PhD and I'm not a purist and, and all of that. As time has gone on, I don't know if it's just my historical fiction or if it's everybody's, it's gained a lot more respect. And what I'm hearing now, and I'm actually, I'm going to give you a perfect a little aside here. I'm speaking at the Lincoln Forum in uh, November uh, 18th. Uh, the Lincoln Forum, you talk about, it's the ultimate in Lincoln historians getting together, and there's a pile of them. Um, and they, again, they used to be really dismissive of me. Now I'm speaking. Now they're bringing me in there to do a panel. Uh, to talk about the benefits of historical fiction. So it's come a long way. I think the reason for that is people, historians, realize that if you teach, if you, if you write a book that could be used in a classroom as a textbook, nobody outside that classroom is going to want to read that, and probably three-fourths of the people in that classroom don't want to read it. Um, so if you read something you know I've done or somebody else has done, where you get, and this is what I've heard from teachers that started using my books in their classroom, which is an amazing thing. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, it adds to the responsibility I have to get it right, you know, get the facts straight. You, you can't screw around with history. 
you know, you have to be honest about that. But if you can give, and this is what the teachers have told me, if you can give the student a character that they can relate to, or you just tell them a really good story that hooks them, they don't even know they're learning the history. And I mean, I've heard that a lot. And so, I mean, I pay attention to that when I write with it always in my mind that, you know, it's very possible that somebody in the 11th grade, you know, a couple of years from now is going to be reading this. And so, okay, how does that go? I mean, how, you know, how do I make it readable? How do I make it more interesting um, and still tell the story? Well, it seemed to have worked. Um, and as the time goes on, I run into more and more historians who are fans of my work, which is a huge thing. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised by that. But it's a real nice thing to happen. Before I let you go, uh, can we talk a little bit about your latest release, The Shadow of War, a novel of a Cuban missile crisis? What led you to this new topic and what surprised you the most when doing this research? Well, the book itself it was something we talked about 10 years ago. And then for, I got sidetracked. We did some other projects. But one of the reasons it was appealing to me is I was there. I mean, I was 10 years old. And so I remember what it was like, and I, and, and I was in Tallahassee, Florida. Anybody who reads this book will see that there's a you know, college professor and his kids in Tallahassee, Florida. Well, you know, it's, it's not giving away a great secret who those people represent. Um, but, I mean, I can remember the thing about Tallahassee, it was on the route for the Army sending all the trucks south, you know, all the big deuce and a half, uh, the green trucks filled with troops, going to Key West, going to Tampa, going to Orlando, uh, and they came right through Tallahassee. So for three days, nonstop, these trucks came through. It was terrifying. Um, and then I had the neighbor who built the fallout shelter, um, you know, who, who actually convinced himself and his family that a 20-foot by 20-foot concrete block box um, underground will save you in the event of nuclear attack um, and the question always was, how long do you have to stay down there? And how much food do you have to take? And don't forget the can open. Um, you know, all of these kind of these silly, some of it, it sounds silly now. It wasn't silly at the time. What do you do with sewage? I mean, th things nobody wanted to talk about at the time. And I knew a guy, and one of my neighbors, you know, building that thing. Um, and, you know, that, that story is in the book. And there's a uh, Quite a few things that happened around that town that um, I mean, duck and cover. Anybody my age knows what duck and cover is. Um, you know, the, the ridiculousness of a teacher telling you, you know, you're in a classroom, climb down, you know, get underneath your desk, put your hands over your head, and I'm going to close the curtains in case there's a nuclear attack. Um, I mean, and, and, and people hear that today and they think it's utter, you know, utterly idiotic. They're right. It was utterly idiotic, but we did it. And so there's all, you know, that part of it, the personal part of it really appealed to me. The other thing is this, you know, I've done nothing but war books up to now. My publisher told me about three or four years ago, eh, it's time to get away from that. You know, you've sort of run that as far as you can run it. Um, so we started looking at other ideas, and I did a book on Teddy Roosevelt, you know, which is not war. I mean, it, it has war in it, the Spanish-American War, but it's not a war book. And so, I, you know, I, it, it, that went over very well. And, and this the Shadow of War, the Cuban book, was next. Um, and, the, and again, it's not a war book. Thank God it's not a war book because we wouldn't be here to talk about it if the war had happened. But the war came close, and a lot of people, even people who were alive at the time, don't really understand how close. I mean, how, how close it came to nuclear annihilation. I mean, the world would have ended. And, you know, there were people on the Russian side telling Khrushchev, push the button. There were people that one of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was telling JFK, push the button, um, you know, strike first. And then the concept of a winnable nuclear war. And I actually heard somebody say this. We could start the war. We would lose 20 to 40 million people, but we'd wipe them out. And that was an acceptable number that, you know, to, to have a winnable nuclear war. I mean, that's incredible. But at the time, that's the way people were thinking. 
I have Khrushchev's memoir, which is fabulous. When I was a kid, Khrushchev was the bad guy. That's all you knew about him is he, you know, he was he was the evil Russian guy. Um, in fact, he's a three-dimensional human being. He's got a grandson. Um, you know, he's got his son, actually, his son is the one who smuggled the manuscript out of Russia. Uh, and it was translated into English because of, of Sergei Khrushchev, his, his son, just passed away a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, there's so there's great material. Um, but and I was drawn, you know, I don't tell this from JFK's point of view. That would have been easy. I do it from Bobby Kennedy's point of view, junior, uh, senior, sorry. Um, and because he's there and he's seeing his brother and what it's like for his brother to go through all this stuff. Because, you know, JFK has got to make the decision. He, he's the ultimate decision maker uh, of what's going to happen. And the pressure of that and the people around him giving him advice. I mean, this is an incredible story. My main goal in telling this is not to tell it to the people who already know, but to tell it to the people who don't. People, you know, 30-year-olds, you know, uh, Gen X or, you know, millennials who have no idea what really happened then, um, and they need to. They need to know because it could happen again. And there's a lot more players um, on the stage now than there were back then. Uh, I mean, when you've got, you know, between North Korea and India and Pakistan and Iran and Israel and, you know, besides Britain and France, you know, all these people, they all have nuclear weapons now. Um, gee, uh, that's a little tougher to manage. So I want people to read this and understand that this could happen again if we're not really, really careful. Yeah, very fitting for the times. It seems like it's a perfect you said you've been on it for 10 years, but this is perfect timing for that book. And a couple of things you mentioned here, too, that are interesting that kind of made me think about it. A lot of people don't realize how big of a role RFK played in the, you know, in the Cuban Missile Crisis and making that ultimate deal to kind of end it, in a sense. Yeah, and what's interesting about RFK is that, you know, he's the Attorney General of the United States. And that's what JFK appoints him when, when JFK is elected. Well, he's the Attorney General. Okay, he's got certain specific things that he's supposed to do. He ends up because JFK realizes um, that Bobby, that his brother, is the one person he can trust more than anybody else. And so that their relationship is based on that. And that's huge. And then at the end, you know, I won't give it all away, but I mean, Bobby is the one who makes the deal with the Russian ambassador. Um, you know, usually that's the job of the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, in, in this case. No, it's Bobby does that. And he's got, there's a Russian spy who, uh, you know, reaches out to him and they become friends. Uh, it's sort of like the back room way of getting from one leader to the other. Um, I love that. You know, it's so much fun. Uh, and, you know, he gets, I love the one scene where he gets visited by J. Edgar Hoover, you know, the head of the FBI, who is not a nice man. And Hoover comes, because Hoover hates Bobby. Because Bobby's, as attorney general, he's doing things that Hoover doesn't like, including civil rights. Bobby is supporting all these people in the South, um, Medgar Evers and uh, you know, so forth. I mean, Martin Luther King. Um, and and you know, Bobby is friends with these people. He's supporting what they're doing, as is JFK. Well, you know, J. Edgar Hoover is keeping files on them. He's keeping dossiers on Martin Luther King and all this stuff. So he doesn't trust what the Kennedys are doing at all. And then they, it sort of comes to pass that, that later that uh, uh, J, J. Edgar Hoover is also keeping a dossier on Bobby Kennedy. I mean, it's, it's really sort of, it's very strange uh, what was going on in those days. So, Mr. Shearer, what's next? Yeah, I, I uh, have a notebook. Actually, you, you can't see my desk. It's covered with books. Um and, you know, I'm, I, I have notes and, you know, tabs and notes and all this stuff. I'm working on a novel on Abraham Lincoln. Now, this is a challenge. Number one, because there's so much stuff. I mean, there's so much material and I have to sort through it. And, and I've done that. I mean, I've done a huge amount of work on that. Um, and, and I'm writing the manuscript right now. I need to be finished with this thing in the fall um, and it'll be out in the next summer. But um, it, it, it's a real challenge because I, I didn't want to do 
the way I did Teddy Roosevelt, I sort of focused on his whole life, sort of episodic things in his whole life. Can't do that with Lincoln. There's too much. So I'm, I'm starting this with the beginning of well, his election in 1860, which is what triggers the Civil War. And it triggers the secession of South Carolina and then all the other states. Um, how he deals with that, how he deals with his own generals and politicians, uh, how he deals with his wife, which is a whole other story. Um, it all enters into it, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying this because it's intriguing. And boy, there's a lot of stuff I didn't know, and I, I suspect there's a lot of stuff a lot of people don't know. I oh, can't wait. Uh, where can our listeners go to find out uh, more about your projects and past and future and what you're up to? Well, the, the easiest way to, first of all, you can get in touch with me. You've been, people write me letters or you know emails all the time. I answer them all. It is me answering them. It's not some. I have people are so cynical. People see you know, they they assume that it's some third party, you know, fulfillment center or something. No, no, no. It's me. It really is. So just go to my website, jeffshara.com. I mean, it's it's very easy. I have all my books in there and everything because a lot of books, a lot of the hard covers you can't find anymore. I have them. Um, and, you know, I, I autograph everything. You, you can tell me how to autograph. And then you read. I, I put a personal note in there that I update every, you know, every few days. Um, and also there's a page in there that tells you where I'm going to be. If I'm going to be doing a book signing or an appearance somewhere, that's in there as well. So you know, that's the simplest way to get a hold of me. The other part of the, the answer to your question is if somebody's interested in a book, go to Amazon. I mean, Amazon's got most, or at least paperbacks. Um, and you know they, they've got everything. Uh, Audible, you know, you can if you're if you're a, a listener rather than a reader, uh, my stuff is in Audible. So it's um you know again I hope to hear from people because I enjoy that. I mean I, I enjoy feedback and not all of it's positive. I mean I get I don't know why people feel the need to write me and say I didn't like your latest book. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but um, they're not all home runs, you know. I can't do that. But anyway, uh, yeah, the easiest way is to go to my website. Awesome, so Shara, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. My pleasure. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Kearns, and I host the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, where I cover the history and culture of England from the departure of the Romans in the 5th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So far, we've surveyed the collapse of Roman rule in Britain, the migration of the Anglo-Saxons, and the history of Northumbria from its beginnings in the mists of legend to its destruction at the hands of Viking raiders in the 9th century. I hope you'll come and give it a go.